Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Henry Parker Presents Special Edition. Today we have a guest, the one, the only, Common Fields. How do you do? Thank you. First of all, no. so let's get down to brass tacks. Okay. The book you've written. Uh, was it Going Back to T-Town? Going Back to T-Town. Okay. The Ernie Fields Territory Big Band. Okay. So I'm going to let you take it away. Give us... A brief history of that. Well, um, this book was about 30 years or so in the making. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was a, a big band leader mm -hmm. uh, and, and led an orchestra from the late 1920s to the early 1960s. Okay. I call him the last of the great territory big bands. Territory because he... Uh, although he was based in Oklahoma and did the circuit, the Chitlin circuit in Kansas City and Dallas, that area, he also had the opportunity to travel all mm -hmm. over uh, the country. But he was trained as an electrician okay. uh, at Tuskegee mm -hmm. uh, Institute, it was in that day, and came back to the famed Black Wall Street area of Tulsa and started work as an electrician and heard some guys rehearsing and struck up conversation and long story short, uh, became their leader mm -hmm. and enlarged the organization and traveled all over the country. The book is biographical in a sense, but the arc of the story is from when he was discovered okay. by John Hammond, the great talent scout and jazz impresario and goes to the end is my father's uh, largest mu musical triumph. Now your dad played, excuse me, your dad played what instrument? He played trombone. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was his principal uh, instrument but he uh, also dabbled on the piano but uh, in terms of the orchestra he was a leader and a trombone. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. So, uh, Having a band like that, what was how many pieces did he travel with? Uh, be, when he first began uh, in around 1927 or so, mm -hmm. there were eight or nine, and they traveled in two automobiles. Okay, uh, but he uh, a dealer, a, a automobile dealer called him once and gave him a deal on a bus. Okay. Uh, and by this time, he had enlarged to 17 oh, wow. people uh, and carrying their instruments and uniforms and all of that. So he got a secondhand uh, bus to travel in. Uh, and <clears throat> he was proud of the fact that, A, he paid cash for it. B, he had a driver who was not a uh, shade tree okay. driver, as they were <laughs> referred to, but a real <laughs> <laughs> but a real driver who had a license, had been trained, and that was important because the driver, while the band or the orchestra was performing, he was in charge of keeping the bus in tip-top shape Good. and mm -hmm. doing repairs or anything uh, of that order. And um, so that that was uh, travel with that many pieces from like the 30s uh, through uh, the 40s and into the 50s and performed in all of the major venues, the Apollo Theater, mm -hmm. um, uh, the Royal Theater mm -hmm. in Baltimore, uh, Detroit, uh, even in the far west, Portland, Oregon, mm -hmm. uh, Washington, Seattle, Washington, um, some of the popular venues at that time in Los Angeles, uh, California as well. And I think part of, while the Ernie Fields name may not be familiar with a lot of people in your audience, the territory bands were a major training ground okay. for other musicians to hone their skills, learn what life was like on the road because some didn't adapt to that uh, very well. But uh, the, many musicians, 
came through his organization to go through to higher fame and recognition. Um, Can you give me an example of a few? Oh, um, one you may be familiar with, Yusef Latif. Really? Yes, Yusef oh, wow. Latif was an alum of the Ernie Fields Orchestra and, um, in the 40s. And he had, uh, I'm trying to think when my father picked him up, I think was out of uh, Chicago. And, uh, and this was before his name was Yusef Latif. His name was William Evans at that time. That's a slave uh, name for those that yes, don't know. <laughs> yes. And he, uh, my father describes him as being very Muslim-minded at that point. And from time to time would ask if it was all right at sunrise, if they were on the road, if they could pull over so, he could so, pray. so that he could pray. I had the pleasure of hearing him play here at the jazz workshop. Okay. Okay, well, yes, he was he was an alum of the Ernie Fields oh. Orchestra and mentions that experience in his autobiography mm -hmm. uh, as well. Um, one, uh, another musician you may have heard of who was with the uh, orchestra for about two weeks when they were in the St. Louis area uh, was Miles Davis. Really? Wow. Miles Davis. And... Uh, kind of on a tryout basis. He was kind of hanging around uh, the orchestra, as my father tells the story. And uh, one of his uh, singers said, I believe this young man wants to be in the band. So they were going to be in several engagements in St. Louis, East St. Louis, uh, Southern Illinois. So they brought him along for a tryout. And my father decided uh, he plays right nicely but you can't really hear him. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't find him. And of course, Miles is known for a softer tone. Yeah. Than his, but that, that didn't sit well with my father. So it was a joke till the day he died. <laughs> <laughs> Ernie Fields wouldn't fool with Miles Davis. <laughs> so. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And the last chapter of the book I call The Roll Call because I tried to find information about everybody who had been with the Ernie Fields Orchestra, whether it was for one day, one night, mm -hmm. months, or years. And uh, because it was my father's fervent wish that I mention as the many names, as, as I, mm -hmm. I could, he said they must have been worth something or I would not have had them in my organization. Right. So I tried to honor that. And it's, you know, it's over 100 names uh, yeah. uh, on the list. Now, traveling with, whether it be 8 or 18, in particularly in the South, with the, situ with the racial climate back then, how did he navigate that, like uh, segregation, like hotels, uh, restaurants, etc.? Well, um, one story in the book, uh, when he hired uh, a white musician, and he believes he was one of the first to hire a white musician, he said uh, to him, uh, he likes to think that he would pick a man because of his talent, but you can be helpful to us in getting food on right. the road. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, he also, another story that he always told is the bus had two 40-gallon tanks for gasoline mm -hmm. and he would keep one tank full and when the other began to get low he would pull into a service station and he said uh, the average service station that bus that's a big haul mm -hmm. uh, and they come out and he'd say uh, tell him he wanted to fill up and he said but uh, will we be able to use the restrooms and if they said no they couldn't so he right would on. drive on, and that was his his way of maintaining a modicum of dignity and uh, also letting his dollars uh, do the talking. All right, my father did the same thing. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we'll save that for another discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so but I, you know, he considers himself uh, really blessed. Okay, that uh, there weren't there were brushes with some violence. Uh, but there were never really any just uh, uh, outstanding or, or things where they lost uh, property or uh, fires or 
or lynchings or anything of that nature, but he says he learned to watch and pray. Um, another uh, story he would tell, they were trying, the bus had broken down and they were stopped waiting for a tow. The service station attendant said he couldn't leave but until his replacement came mm -hmm. and that would tow him to the next town to get service. And in the meantime, uh, a ruffian said, uh, you can't stay here. Uh, uh, you have to go uh, some f feet ahead to this telephone pole where uh, uh, Negroes were allowed to be in the next town over, but not where they were. And uh, so they ended up pushing the bus past the telephone pole, but they're still trying to figure out how they're going to get towed, how they, you know. And a white gentleman came, d going the opposite direction, but surveyed what had happened and turned around and said he would be willing uh, mm -hmm. to tow them to the service station. And he did. And my father asked, well, how much do I owe you? And he says, not a thing. I, You know, I won't accept. And my father was so grateful. He couldn't believe the kindness right. of this stranger. But he said, uh, he had a young boy, some eight-year-old boy. He said, well, let me give a tip to your uh, son. And so he started out counting out dollar bills. And he said, got to about five or six. And the man said, that's enough. And... Uh, so a lot of times, just the kindness of strangers mm -hmm. uh, ended up in his favor. Now, when he was on the road, in the course of a year, how much time would you say he spent on the road? In different years, different amounts. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember as a child, he would be away for, say, three weeks, home for a week, away for three or four days, back home for a week. Uh, then uh, one-nighters back and forth at home and away. Uh, so, that, you know, there were good years and there were bad years, mm -hmm. but I can't quantify. But, you know, there were right. sometimes he was away for long stretches, two and three months oh, uh, wow. at, at a time, uh, particularly when they were going to the far west or traveling up into Canada. Um, so they uh, he, he was a, a real good letter writer and wrote to my mother see what seemed like All almost time. daily and she kept a lot of those letters mm -hmm. and uh, that was lucky uh, for me because I was able to add uh, some of those to the book and uh, he was very frugal because one of the letters mentions that uh, postage is only six cents and you put an eight cent stamp on the letter that that you had sent, uh, so uh, back then two cents goes a long oh, way. Oh yes, indeed, yes, indeed. Uh, and he, uh, sh she, kept the home fires burning. My mother was a school teacher, and uh, he, after he paid the musicians and uh, whatever expenses they had, he would religiously send money home. Um, uh, but in one of his letters, he references. Uh, I don't want you to do without for whatever little money mm -hmm. that that I'm able to send. Uh, don't don't deny yourself. Mm -hmm. So uh, they had a very strong relationship. She was also very tolerant of his way of life, his profession, and he often said, "If there's one thing I love your mother for to this day is she never." Uh, complain about him being on the road mm -hmm. and said you had that horn in your mouth when we met you'll never hear me say put it down mm -hmm. now since as, as you have the book here with you is anything you'd like to read in that? well uh, how about I share with you how he was discovered be my guest okay uh, it's in one of the early chapters it's called the discovery a five dollar tip and a chance at the big time um, as I had mentioned earlier, he was discovered by John Hammond, who was like the, he discovered Count Basie, and later on he discovered Bruce Springsteen and Janis Joplin. Um, 
He was always on the prowl for talent. In the late 30s, Hammond was still scouting, looking for someone he could maybe turn national, Ernie would recall often. And so Hammond travels brought him back to Kansas City. He looked and he hadn't run into anything and asked some questions, Ernie remembered. Somebody asked him if he'd ever heard of Ernie Fields' band. The impresario got to talking around, and as Ernie tells it, of course, Charlie Yardbird Parker, the saxophonist and composer, and all the guys in jazz knew about the Ernie Fields band because, quote, I had outstanding men, Luther West and all. They hung out together and all. They told him that Ernie Fields is in Tulsa, Oklahoma, so Hammond went to Tulsa. He ends up at a, a hotel uh, bar and is asking around, and the waiter at the, the bartender uh, says he knows of Ernie Fields, and Hammond asks, how could I get a hold to him? The waiter told him Fields had a telephone, so Hammond asked if he would mind calling Ernie, and the waiter made the call. I wasn't in, Ernie recalled. I was on a gig out uh, on a gig that night. I remember that week, and I was in a little hick town around. The waiter came back and told Hammond that Ernie wasn't in and that I was playing that night. So Hammond told him again, go call and give him my room number. I'm in the Mayo Hotel, and tell him to call me when he gets up tomorrow. The waiter called again and gave Ernie's wife, Bernice, the number at the hotel and told her to tell him to call me. She agreed. The name John Hammond didn't mean anything to her, and uh, Hammond thanked the waiter and gave him a $5 bill. The waiter told him he didn't have change, but Hammond told the waiter, that's yours. The waiter went back to the telephone a third time to call Bernice and said, Mrs. Fields, I hate to keep bothering you. I don't know who that is, but you tell Ernie to be sure and contact that man. It must be something awful important. He apparently is somebody big. He just gave me a $5 tip for a nickel telephone call. Wow. And that's how it all began. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Now, coming from Tulsa, I have to touch on this. The race riots. How, does that, how did that play out growing up? Was it talked about or? Uh, it, was, it was whispered about. Okay. Uh, but it was not a part of any uh, formal uh, discussions. We, discussions. We had Oklahoma history in school. We had what was called Negro history in schools and high school. Then it was never, never discussed. Uh, you would hear whispers about it, or that you know that something had happened, or that that had happened, but nobody that you respected. Would, would, con it. would confirm uh, that or not. And uh, so it was, uh, it was just a kind of rumor on the rumor mill uh, until uh, I guess I, I was fortunate enough in the uh, 80s, 19, I mean, sorry, 1993, to do a documentary about segregation and use Tulsa as the prototype. And at that time, we touched on Mm -hmm. uh, what was called the race riot then it's called the race massacre now and we were fortunate enough to be able to interview some of the survivors uh, during that time but my father was not in Tulsa in okay. 1921 okay. he was in Tuskegee in college and he didn't he graduated in 1924 and came to Tulsa as the Black Wall Street was being rebuilt. Okay. And you have to remember, it was rebuilt and flourished again. So you never hear of that. Yeah, flourished again into the 50s. And then uh, what we call urban renewal, or some of us that call did. urban removal. Exactly. Brought a highway straight through oh, wow. uh, the Greenwood section of, of Tulsa. And it has never been the same. There have been efforts and there is some business and development going on. Uh, there's a class three ballpark on the edge of Greenwood that I believe probably brings some traffic mm -hmm. and business there. But the the flourishing community of black owned businesses said, we that, I knew, have this. Yeah, that I knew of yeah. as a youth is no longer exists. Oh wow, interesting. Mm -hmm. But I'm not surprised. Because mm -hmm. I know They've talked about reparations and this and that. 
But that's another story in itself. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so, next question. How did you get involved in journalism? Oh, wow. Um, I guess it was just uh, something that was in me. Or better yet, you had no <laughs> desire to be a musician? That's You got that right. <laughs> um, my brother, uh, Ernie Fields Jr., mm -hmm. is a multi-instrumentalist. Okay. And everything he touched... He could play, turn to music. And uh, I, coming up, didn't like being compared to him or my father, being expected that I you was said, I got to go my own I way. Gotta, and so I think because of sibling rivalry, I found uh, I like to write, I like to read. Uh, I started my own newspaper when I was about 9 or 10 years old with a typewriter mm -hmm. and carbon paper and and stuff, and I uh, had a teacher in the seventh grade, an English teacher, that had a unit on journalism uh, during that class. And from then on, the rest is history. The right? rest is history. I also had the benefit of uh, the black newspaper in my community, the Oklahoma Eagle. Uh, the uh, people who owned that newspaper gave me a chance for exposure mm -hmm. uh, then, and that, that was very critical and helpful. Now, too. you attended what college? I attended Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri, Okay. Uh, which at the time had uh, the only degree program in journalism. And um, so that was another reason that, uh, that I went there. And then I came to Boston to go to graduate school in uh, in journalism, and I haven't been able to raise bus fare home yet, so I'm okay. just, I'm kind of stuck no. now. With your career in Boston, uh, just touch a little bit on certain, what are more some of your more memorable events that you found interesting. Oh boy, oh, that's it, there are so many, and it's so long ago. I I feel fortunate enough. Uh, that I was able to uh, have tenure at the Boston Globe newspaper at a time when uh, school desegregation was, I was the, about, I wanted to bring was, that up. It was the big story of the time. And uh, the Globe uh, subsequently won a Pulitzer Prize in public service for the coverage of school desegregation. So I'd like to think that uh, my contributions mm -hmm. were, were a part of that. Um, uh, after a tenure at the Globe, I came to the attention of uh, Channel 7, an executive there, and uh, worked in television news at 7. Uh, and, oh boy, I, you know, everything from three alarm fires to murders, mayhem, to graduations, to you know, all, all manner of stories that a, a, a general assignment reporter does. Now, from... As from a reporter's point of view, how have you seen the city change over the years? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> well, the biggest change that I can note is that a person of color is the mayor of Boston. And that was uh, something that uh, the communities uh, desired and looked forward to and thought would come very uh, close in the personage of uh, Mel King. And uh, I can remember when uh, Tom Atkins uh, right. mm -hmm. ran for mayor, too. But it just seemed to be uh, a goal out of reach. Uh, would, you, so, would you say uh, they're not quite ready yet? No, I wouldn't say that. Uh, I, you know, I'm not, sure. I'm not a, a political analyst or right. a pundit. I'm not exactly sure the reasons why, except I know voter turnout has a lot okay. to do with it. And uh, some some people in all communities have or still have to be convinced that their vote counts. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure of the reasons why, but I think there are, are qualified Candidates people there. Um, and uh, they have to be persuaded from within. I think it's a, a, a movement of persuading them or calling, like a minister is called uh, to preach. A candidate has to be called. The candidate can't say, I'm going to be mayor. Come on and follow me. 
I think it has to come mm -hmm. from within and and pushed up. Now, when you watch TV now, uh, <laughs> what comes to mind when you see you see a lot more black and Hispanic faces on the news, etc.? Well, I I might quibble with you that you see a few more, but I. Go ahead I'm and quibble. Be my guest. I I, I Bring watch. It. <laughs> I, maybe not as closely as I should, but uh, I, I won't mention the channel. I think it was, uh, it's been in the past weekend, and I can't remember which day. And of course, I know a lot of people are on vacation. or. Mm -hmm. But I was looking at the 6 o'clock news on one of the local mm -hmm. stations, and I was struck by the fact that uh, the first five stories mm -hmm. were all white reporters, and there were two anchors, white anchors, at the desk. I believe it was the sixth story was a young woman that had a, what seemed like a Spanish surname. And, you know... So, that, pretty much nothing has really <laughs> changed. Not, not that I can see. The, I haven't closely analyzed it, let's just but say, I don't they put, see... They put a melanated face in strategic positions. I, I met, perhaps in some, but, they, you know, I, they're not... To my knowledge, any black news directors in in Boston, uh, mm -hmm. um, maybe I believe there is one at uh, WGBH okay. Radio. Um, uh, executive producers, I think there's a similar absence. Uh, we still have a long way mm -hmm. to go, and I'm you know I've been active for. A number of years with the National Association of Black Journalists, and that is one of the missions to have our stories told and to have a seat at the table when the decisions are being made. Now, do you find that a lot of that has to do with the fact that a lot of young folk don't go into that field, or? I don't know. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know, uh, and what the schools are putting out, or I. I, I just have no way to intelligently analyze mm -hmm. that. Um, I, I'd like to think that uh, they can, because there's so many more avenues for communications. When when I was starting out, you know, there was four, five, seven, and 56 mm -hmm. that had news. Now they're cable and MSNBC and CNN and Fox and, I, you know, a whole... Now, there's local cable access, right. and some have news. Uh, uh, Boston has a news station, mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, so uh, there are avenues, and people are doing podcasts and and all manner of communication. So there are a lot more avenues for young people of any color, mm -hmm. uh, but for our people in particular to pursue if they're interested and have the determination. Before we forget, where can people get the book? The book is available by uh, the usual suspects, Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, Barnes & Noble, and I'm also the press, the publisher is the University of Oklahoma Press. Mm -hmm. And if you go to oupress.com and look for the book until January 5th, there's a 40% discount, and on the website it has a code that you put in, and you can get a 40% mm -hmm. a discount. Also, it's available in many of the local bookstores. In fact, I have events coming up in uh, February 1st at Belmont Books. Um, I'll be in conversation with Tessel Collins, a, a marvelous jazz mm -hmm. uh, radio producer, uh, about the Ernie Fields Orchestra and the book, and the book will be for sale there. And the 2nd of February, I'll be at Frugal Books, uh, the black-owned bookstore in Roxbury, mm -hmm. uh, for uh, a reading and signing of the book. So just about anywhere, anybody that wants the book, they and can get it. Your closing statement, please? Any closing statement? Yeah. Um, I think I wanted to have my father's place in history secured however small it may be. I'm not saying he was as prolific as a Duke Ellington 
or Cal Basie or Cab Calloway, but he was there and he contributed as a leader, uh, as, a, as a writer, a songwriter, and a recording artist. And he has a story to tell about perseverance mm -hmm. and survival uh, that I believe is so important for our people to hear, for all people to hear. And with that, I want to thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity. It was an honor. Oh, my, my honor as well. And with that, folks, as I say, stay black. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good.